Hello and welcome to another episode of Steel Fur Speaks with, of course, me, Steel Fur. Today here to talk about chain, specifically classic constructed chain, adult chain here. We're on the website. This guy has the best art in Monarch. Maybe there's a competition with Prism, but, you know, I think some of this guy's art plus the foiling is just way, way, way up there. So, you know, that's what we're going to do. So let's talk about chain. Bound by shadows, eclipse existence. He can travel to the world of dark matter. He has a trait, rune blades, magic swords, and light bits of arcane damage coming in from everywhere, and a massive dark demonic motif that some people might find disturbing. But, you know, if you like high fantasy, part of your soul wants to see the bad guys be awesome so the good guys can be good and what says awesome more than a rune blade with huddling masses beneath him um tailing everyone to his will or summoning a tree of someone's blood out of a fallen enemy that is power right there um so let us dive into a bit of chain um, so I've been playing Chain um, Constructed for a bit now. Um, I've been playing just in local events. Uh, we have a Constructed online every Friday. And I've been playing in the online charity league um, that, you know, um, has been going on, run by the guys in New Zealand, Card Merchants. Um, it's raised, a te I think, 40 grand New Zealand dollars or something for the charity at this point. It's ridiculous. Um, I've gone 6-2 in that after eight rounds. I'm probably not, unfortunately, going to make it into the top cut. My losses were, sadly, fairly early on to some very good New Zealand players who I got paired up to in rounds three and four. Um, but, you know, going 6-2 in my first Classic Constructed tournament against, you know, a lot of New Zealand players who are obviously a lot more experienced on that front. I can't say I'm really disappointed with that. I'm going to talk through the deck that I played in that tournament pros and cons of my card choices, alternatives you could consider, and of course we're going to watch a match that I recorded of myself versus Prism. So let's, without any further ado, dive straight into the deck list for that. So, in my deck, I was running... Mm, the sideboard isn't loading, that's a bit weird. Um, I was running mostly Nebula Blade, Reaping Blade sometimes against Bravo, uh, but Nebula Blade is very good. Um, I had considered the Galaxy Black. There were times when I had one resource left over. But ultimately, you know, in CC, the ability to swing for four and get a rune chant if they don't commit two cards or get an equipment is just so strong. And you will have a lot of blues. You'll see I've got 26 blues. You will have blues to use for that. Um, so then the equipment, pretty much just running either Eben Fust or Ebenfold or Arcanite Skullcap, depending on the matchup. Uh, Arcanite for the heroes where you really need blocks, so Dorinthia, Reinar, uh, Bravo, um, Husk, all the time. And then Ebonfold, pretty much for like um, every other matchup, just because I think it helps smooth out some really big turns, get some cards into Banish so you can get their bonuses, things like that. Um, Crown of the Dichotomy in there, mostly for the Viscerai matchup. Um, I don't actually run any null rune versus chain in the mirror um i think that it just becomes a race of aggression and the person who sacrifices their skull cap um or their fold for a crown is going to lose uh grasp self-explanatory blocks for two amazing in a slower game where you can pitch a blue make a rune chant do some damage the rune chants turn on so many things in um you know meet and greet stuff like that Scalar speaks for itself. Go again and chain is huge. Having some there for the really big turn where you haven't drawn the go again is perfect. Um, Art of War obviously does it does what it says on the tin. Eclipse because you will summon your demon. Um, I have summoned the demon in I think three out of six games, uh, maybe three out of eight games, four out of eight games. Um, he does come up late game. Uh, you will be playing lots of Seeds of Agony late game. You will get Eclipse off if it's in your Banish Zone. So that can be a really great finisher. It can be really good against um, some of the light heroes that come up. I do expect Bolton. I do expect Prism in every CC event. Uh, Bolton is quite strong. Prism is 
you know, beloved of many, even though she's, you know, how to build her is still up in the air. She is beloved of many. So the um, the free attack, the free go again from Ursa will come in handy. Invert Existence is on the sideboard. Amazing versus other chain players. Um, you could either wait for their out of resources. Very late game. Only, only late game. And banish two blood deck cards and make them take four damage. Um, if a chain player overextends against you and you have invert existence and they're on very low life, it can definitely be worth it to invert existence them, take them down, say, four damage um, from blood debt plus the uh, two arcane and just use that four damage advantage to take them over the edge. If you get two or th two of them late game, someone could be on eight, you could kill them outright. So that's something to consider. Doing that early game is risky as hell. You don't want to be giving people more banished cards to use as an engine against you uh i've included i because i have i and i want to include it um entirely optional uh it's there because i really like opting um i like um pitching uh an i to pay for an even fold on my opponent's turn opting for two um i like just you know having a bit of an idea on what's on the top of my deck for shadow puppetry or for dimensional gateway um, I generally just like having Eye in the deck. It's probably not the most optimal card. Could definitely cut it, but I, I've I've had uses. And to be fair, the Eye was also in there uh, from an earlier version of this deck, which ran Guardian of the Shadow Realm. And I think if you run Guardian of the Shadow Realm and even Fold, then you definitely want to have Eye, because you can pitch Eye to pay for Guardian, and then also even fold and opt two and pick the card you draw, etc., etc., etc. So I works good with even fold as well. So there's a few reasons it's in there, but don't see I on this list and think, oh my god, I have to have fabled. That's just not that's not how it is. Onto the reds, I think a lot of people will see the attacker, um, the attack mix up here and kind of think, oh well, that just looks like Blitz Prism, but a bit more. And really, that is kind of the theme of my. CC deck is Blitz Prism, but uh, sorry, Blitz Chain, but more. Uh, the Bounding Demigons go up to three, Commander Conquers to three. And Lightning Strike stays at two just because um, there's a lot more setup turns where I don't know that I necessarily want it. Um, I may put this up to three. It is always a card I want to see. Um, I'm just, I just think two is a, a nice number for it. Meet and Greet, Riftbind Blue is probably going to come out now. Um, I've kind of moved away from Riftbind Blues. Um, towards more Howl from Beyond Blue or Plunder Run Blue, um, rather than running the Riftbind Blue. Um, I might even go back to Bounding Demigon Blue. And the one thing, actually, no, the one I'm, I'm probably going to replace this with Meet and Greet Blue. Um, I've really been enjoying Meet and Greet. Though I will say that Riftbind Blue in CC is very, very different to Riftbind Blue in Blitz. Um, you're pitching all of those Seeds of Agony and stuff like that to the bottom of the deck, your Howl from Beyonds, etc, etc. So it's not uncommon that a Riftbind Blue late game will come in for five, um, which is a good reason to sort of keep those in, because you can pitch red and blue Riftbinds, um, it does block for free, and if you... Um, and if you come into it late game, it can still do quite a lot of damage with combo chains and things like that. Um, Shadow Versa speaks for itself, Soul Reaping, of course. Um, two Unhallowed Rites, just because the late game in CC is so important. Um, six cards that put Seeds of Agony and Howl from Beyond on the bottom of your deck. Can't be understated how good that is. Um, I do sometimes get annoyed that I have this and it only swings for two, especially if I flip it late game. So I'm really trying to avoid pitching too many of the blue um, Unhallowed Rites early on, just because I don't necessarily want to see them late game. Um, late game, I kind of very much want a thinned deck that is mostly Seeds of Agony, um, as as few blues as I can get away with, and as many of the red attacks as I can find. Um, two Razor Reflexes, just for that bit of flex and threaten damage. Um, it, it can be good to have it in there. Considering cutting this for more banish consistency, like I think you could replace Razor Reflexes with the Meet and Greet Blues, or with... Um, uh, something else that gives go again, you know, like Captain's Call Yellow or something like that. And then you wouldn't have to rely on having this as a boost. You could use it more consistently. Um, also considering something like, you know, again, I've been saying Plunder Run Blue would fit well. And I'm kind of any of the cards I'm looking at cutting, I'm thinking, what could I replace any of these with? Um, Chains of Eminence, that needs to go up to a three. Um, it is on the sideboard. Do not underestimate how amazing Chains of Eminence are in the mirror. Uh, do not play it early. Play it as late as you can. 
name Seeds of Agony because your opponent, much like you, will have spent a long time putting Seeds of Agony on the bottom of their deck with unhallowed rights and pitching. And if you name Seeds of Agony, likelihood is that person's going to be taking three damage. Um, do not play it too early. Do not play it, you know, do not play it without thinking. Um, if you give your opponent the turn with all of the stuff that they banished the last turn, um, it can be very, very bad for you. So if you misplay this, it can really screw you over. But if you play it right, it can completely destroy the chain player's hope. Um, so things, thinking about chains, um, you know, if you name seeds, there is very likely that things like Unhallowed Rites, uh, Bounding Demigon can't actually be played. Um, it's very often that Seeds is the enabler for those cards. So if you play this one turn and they have Seeds and the Bounding Demigons, they may not actually be able to play those. They may take a lot of blood debt. Chains of Eminence is a really good card versus Chain. Um, Dimensional Crossroads is amazing in CC. Um, a lot of people will be thinking, but you know, you're playing Husk. Why are you playing Crossroads? The reality is this won't get pinged in this deck because you defend a reasonable amount until turn 5 or 6. Um, which means if you get this out on turn one or two, you can still deal um, upwards of 12 damage, 12 arcane damage with it by the time the husk goes. Um, and even even when the husk does go, um, you know, if you need one extra arcane, you can always put this out or put out a rune chant or something like that. Um, Dimensional Gateways mostly is an extra blue. Um, I might replace this with Whisper of the Oracle, uh, but it is, it is nice as an enabler. Um, you know, if you pitch another blue, you draw a card, one arcane damage the opt can be nice um so it's not a bad card i might put in yellows um i did have an idea for a like a chain deck with a lot more opt that ran like red dimensional gateways red blood tributes and really just like played a much slower game and this is another deck that i'm working on in the background that maybe will come out and i'll test it but it, basically i have the idea of a chain deck that has a much slower game while building up shackles that basically opts as often as possible and puts every single blood deck card that it can find to the bottom and just and 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 has all the power combos like piercing shadow vice um you know um just uh, basically all the power combos so the seeds the rift binds the bounding demigons the unhallowed right reds the piercing shadow vice and basically just opts as much of that as it can to the bottom of the deck whilst building up shackles and playing defense reactions and then when you get to the late game and you're flipping six seven cards they're basically just all fire now i'm not sure chain needs to go that way i actually think that this this way um, of just playing aggressive chain is pretty good. Um, I don't necessarily think you need it. Um, Hal from Beyond Red is great. Um, I've been tempted recently to cut this down to two. Um, it does show up a little too often sometimes, um, especially because you can see I'm kind of running a lot of reds and blues. Um, so sometimes it can be tricky to pay for it, though usually I have the resources to pay for it, or I don't mind taking one blood debt to have it the next time. Um, I will, but that is kind of like a flex slot I'm currently working on. Um, I'm tempting at the moment to include Piercing Shadow Vice, maybe instead of one of two of these. Um, Moravian Skies, it's a blue. It can give your cards go again sometimes, some of your cards anyway. Fine. Plunder Run is amazing um, in CC. Get it into the arsenal. It will almost certainly draw you a card because you're going to be hitting with an attack action at some point. Um, and giving the next one plus three is great. You can play this without arsenaling it. Um, that's fine too if it's in your hand and you're not going to get it into your arsenal chucking it down and using it to draw a card and replace itself perfectly fine nine seed speaks for itself it is literally the best blood deck card in the set um there's a reason that every deck plays nine of these there's a reason that people tech chains just to stop people from playing these um it's the best blood deck card in the set um shadow puffetry speaks for itself again how is go again not great um, and then Fate for Scene is in there mostly for the Ira, Dorinthia, not Ira, sorry, Dorinthia, Bravo, and Reinar matchups. Um, I was running red and yellow Fate for Scenes. I was running Guardians of the Shadow Realm. I cut all that out because basically I have a lot of other cards I want to put in my arsenal. So at the moment I'm debating cutting Fate for Scene and putting in Plunder Run Blue. Um, because that will be the two cards basically I want to get into my arsenal will be Plunder Run and Plunder Run Blue um, or Shadow Puppetry. And then basically from there, I'm just going to go with whatever is in my arsenal will be good. Um, the Fate Fazine has done a lot of work for me. The Opt is pretty good. 
uh, having a defense reaction available for some matchups is very good. One of the things you'll note is this deck doesn't have any null rune. It kind of is assuming that Ch uh, Kano isn't going to be showing up. And it's also kind of assuming that even if he does with 30 HP to your 40, you can just race him before he kills you. That's kind of basically the assumption that the deck is is, is working on. Um, whether or not that turns out to be true, I haven't had a lot of CC Kano practice. So we'll see. So there are ways that I would tweak this i think plunder on blue piercing shadow vice i'm considering considering cutting the attack reactions for something else i can play from banish um i'm considering maybe one seeping shadows just to get some late game go again um i'm considering captain's call yellow just to get again a bit more go again into the mix um but really i mean this feels like an optimized version of the big brother of the blitz list that people have been playing and it's been, I would say, really consistent. And you'll see as we switch into the uh, gameplay footage as I commentate this game that it ha it was really quite consistent as as it kind of played through. So here we are watching myself playing um, Prism. Just let me get my face out of the way. Let's go over here, I think. This seems like a... Let's go up here, a nice bit of a dead zone. I'm not in the way. So... We are starting, obviously, Chain versus Luminaris Prism. Um, just picking out our equipment. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm going first in this. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm going first in this. Um, yeah, I know we'd already decided. Now... Some of you might be wondering why I'm running Crown of Dichotomy. Um, that was a choice I made just based on my own experience sitting down versus Prism, um, which w is that um, the Merciful Retribution, <laughs> Merciful Retribution is a good aura. And I have, um, by the way, if you're wondering why I'm looking over here, I have the game playing over here um maybe i should just move that let me just move that so i can actually talk to the camera and not freak anyone out with my eyes going off to the side um so um i opt with the dimensional gateway didn't like the plunder run put that on the bottom got lucky into a red shadow vice two resources get a shackle chuck out the shadow vice uh the unhallowed rights just because it's there um yeah so the crown of dichotomy is there in case i run into aura prism um it is easy enough to get rid of Merciful Retribution, but there is still that basic opportunity that you might take some arcane damage on that turn. So I kind of just take that in. Um, I don't think it was the right decision. I think I should have just gone with Evenfold. Um, but that's clearly not what I had on the table. Um, and of course, this is Luminaris Prism, so actually I probably would have been safe. But I didn't know the weapon before I chose, so that's all right. My opponent's just thinking, thinking hard for turn one. I don't know about you guys, but on turn one, I just tend to chuck my whole hand into the blocks. But I guess he's worried about the second or the third attack. He's not going to get one, though. Um, so I pitch the blue. I go to four resources. I make a rune chant, and I just swing with the sword for one. If he blocks it with a card he wants in his hand, that's fine. If he takes the arcane damage, that's fine. Um, you know... Perfectly fine. Yeah, I think he got a bit confused that he thought the Nebula Blade was coming in for four. Um, but actually, he had already taken the damage. And then he took another one from the um, Nebula Blade because he wanted to get the Genesis into play, which I think is an all right decision. Um, though I don't know why he took four there. That's a bit confusing. Okay, we're going to have to keep an eye on that. Let's just, let's just rewind for a second. Has he accidentally taken too much damage? So we took one from the Unhallowed Rites. 
One from the rune chant, and he's taken four off the sword. Okay. Both of us probably should have spotted that. That's a mistake. Oh, no, 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 wait. No, I tell a lie. I played Dimensional Gateway. Yeah, never mind. That is correct. This is the thing about not commentating in real time. It is good because I can have the conversation with my opponent and then come back and talk through the game and what I was thinking. Um, but obviously, occasionally, I'll just be like, wait a second, was that a mistake? Uh, but I kind of have to trust that myself, who played the game, um, is playing it fairly and doing doing all the right things. Um, yeah, so I end that turn with Soul Reaping in my arsenal, which is great for a bit of a setup power turn, if I have one. Um, unfortunately, you'll see here I've draw, drawn no Blood Deck cards, which means that Soul Reaping is not coming out of my arsenal, unless I banish a non-Blood Deck card, which I might do, um, just to get it out, so I can put you know, Command and Conquer or Razor Reflexes in. Um, but we will see... Um, Uh, how did that Arclight Sentinel get into his soul? Let's just jump back a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. So he put the Arclight in with Genesis. Um, I'm not sure I would banish Arclight Sentinel with Genesis, but I think maybe it was just the, the best choice that he had available at the time. Um, those can be like, I mean, if you pitch those and they come up late game versus chain, they can be very brutal, um, building up a lot of blood debt with attacks you can't play. Um, yep, so he makes a shield, he's going to Herald of Erudition me with Dominate, um, and I am definitely blocking for five here, I have to block for five, I think, yep, three and two, definitely blocking for five, um, really block Herald of Erudition whenever you can, just, just get it gone, um, you know, it's worth a husk once you get past the first few turns. Um, and then I take two damage from his auras, just pinging in for one with Luminaris, which proved to be very effective in this game. It definitely got a lot of health off me, um, as you'll see later on. Uh, it took a while before I would get the tempo to actively um, you know, push down on the damage. So now he's coming in with a seven strength attack and i'm asking myself mm, why did i not block with command and conquer because actually i really should have blocked with command and conquer but i didn't which is annoying me at this point because i should have blocked the herald of erudition with command and conquer and that would have done the trick but i decide to use it now just because i don't really want to take seven damage at this point in the game um and i'm fairly confident that you know if i get to the next turn if i get more chains you know, things will look up for me later on. You will see I do banish my second Command and Conquer, which is kind of annoying. Um, but I think at this point, I kind of just decided to pitch the Eclipse. And if I remember correctly, I got a chain and I swung with the sword. Yeah. Pitch the Eclipse. And swing with the sword for four damage. Oh, no, no. <laughs> See, this is what I mean. I'm second-guessing myself. I actually didn't need to pitch that Eclipse just then. I banished the Razor Reflexes so that I could swing with the Soul Reaping um, as I thought it was the biggest threat this turn, and I wanted to... I wanted to attack him to get rid of some shields, and then I wanted to stab my sword into Genesis. Um, Genesis had to go. Like, it can't... You can't leave Genesis on the board... The good thing about chain into prism is that the first attack can be something big and the second attack can take out the aura. So you, unless they're playing Arknight Sentinel against you, you don't have to, um, you don't basically have to worry so much about their auras as long as you remember to keep them under control. And that does mean that you're not getting, it does mean that you're not getting um, that, um, you know, that, um you're not getting that opportunity to swing with the sword for four you are going to lose some damage but obviously keeping things like genesis off the board is important so he pitched a blue he blocked the arcane damage from the rune chant with that resource and then he 
is going to I don't remember what he did here. We'll see. We'll see what he does. Hmm. Let's see what he does. I think he blocks for six to keep the shields. Um, but I can't quite remember. Yeah, yeah, he blocks for six to keep his shields. Which I don't know, I don't think that's a bad decision. Um, I mean, the shields are pretty good for stabbing, but obviously then I'm going to pitch a blue and I'm going to stab the Genesis with my sword. Which weren't my turn, but that's all right because the sword did its job. He spends his last two resources on another shield, um, which is great. So then he can stab me twice. At least I remember that's what he did. Uh, okay, that's a bit odd. He's doing that on his turn. Uh... I mean, maybe he just wanted the Wartune Herald out of his hand, um, but he did have two resources on my last turn. He could have, he could have blocked with it then. Yeah, there's the two fate for scenes. Not really what you want to see getting banished, but that's all right. Um, I think my goal this turn was to get Dimensional Crossroads into play and attack with something, anything really. Um, whilst also getting that Art of War into Arsenal, because this wasn't a great hand for a big turn. And with the bad banishes, I didn't really want to go... I didn't I didn't really want to Art of War banish a meet and greet. Like, that's a bad start to a combo. So I basically just... Dimensional Crossroads into play. That's fine. And then we're going to go with the Art of War into the Arsenal. And then next turn, that's when we're going to pop in with the sorry I'm just sorting out something quickly um Just running a small little tournament for a few of my friends, so I'm just trying to sort that out. Let's just jump back a bit. Yep, so meet and greet got sync belowed, but that was all right because I got the card from his hand. Um, still taking some damage from the shields, but that's fine. This turn is kind of a success. I got my Art of War in the arsenal. I got my Dimensional Crossroads in play. And then I draw a handful of reds, which is not really what you want from Chain. Like, you want at least one blue, especially because some of these cards cost quite a bit. Um, and my opponent is coming in with a Herald of Erudition, which is not what any of us want to see when you've only got the cut Husk, and it's much too early for Husk, um, and it has Dominate. So at this point, I think I'm pretty resigned to the Herald of Domination going off. I just take the five, um, and I keep some cards to block, um, essentially, the next attack, because there's going to be a next attack. So let's just go back. I don't want standings. I want. Hang on, changing you. GM really is not an intuitive piece of software. Um, cool. I will drop Amish. 
How do I drop Hamish? Anyway, that's fine. I'm going to deal with that in a minute. Um, right, let's get back into this game. Um, so he's drawn two cards. He's probably going to swing at me again. Why wouldn't you? And this is the real thing about playing against Prism in CC. She has the damage to just do these really, really powerful turns. And, um, you know, come in with brutal, brutal stuff. Um, and you kind of just have to deal with it. Um, you know, there's not, there's not that many options. So, you know, do I want to take nine damage from a Phantoclasm after I've already had five from a Herald of Erudition and two from the Shields? No, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. So my hope is, obviously, that he lets me draw a six cost with the Phantom Eclasm, Um, though I'm not sure that's going to happen. He will get rid of my E-Strike, which I think is, yeah, which is definitely the right decision here. Because otherwise I would play the E-Strike to draw a card, um, probably. Maybe use my Scalers to get that out there, depending on what I flipped. Um, you know, and he doesn't know what's in my arsenal, so I could have a, you know, I could have a... Um, you know, a go again in my arsenal, something like that, that could make the E-Strike draw a card play really strong. E-Strike is just amazing in chain. Like, go again, draw a card, both really good. Um, you know. So I draw a Shadow Puppetry, which again is fine. Um, and because I've got the Art of War here, and I've got basically the potential for a lot of damage... I'm actually just taking that on the head because I don't think he's going to have another turn like that, especially if I put the pressure on this turn, as I'm hoping to. And I flip a Howl from Beyond and a Seeds of Agony. This is not amazing for me because I obviously can't pay for Howl from Beyond as is. But clearly the solution here is to pitch something. I go for the Rift Bind because I want it later. And I do Art of War. I banish the Bounding Demigon because it's free. So even if I don't draw blues, I can still play it and not take too much blood debt. Um, and I can play it quite cheaply with the um, Howl from Beyond. And thankfully, I get um, Riftbind. Now, I'm pretty sure this turn I chose plus one damage. But we'll just check. Um, we'll just check when we get into it. Um, We'll see how much damage he takes. I'm pretty sure I chose plus one damage. Um, but we'll know. So if when I play this Bounding Demigod, if I don't get a Shackle, that means I chose Go Again. Um, quite a few turns in CC, so it's hard to say exactly whether or not I did or didn't do something in retrospect. Um, yeah, so the Seeds comes in, and then Absolute Nightmare... I'm pretty sure this is the nightmare. Um, is this when he played the Arclight Herald on me? No. Okay. Because there was there was a turn in this game where he played an Arclight Herald into a, I would say, a big turn I had. And I took a lot of damage. So that's a bit of a spoiler for what's coming up later. Um, so he pitches, he blocks the arcane damage. Um, and he blocks the second arcane damage from the Bounding Demigon. And the Bounding Demigon comes in for... I didn't get a Shackle, so I'll assume it had go again. Yeah, so it'll just come in for four. Well, I think at the moment he's asking me what Hal from Beyond does, so I just explained it to him. Um... I was about to say, no, no, it's not important. Yeah, so he blocks for three, and he loses a shield. 
He blocks for three and the skull cap. So then I get a shackle and I swing with the nebula blade. Um, at this point, my logic is that I want to force him to overcommit on a block so that I can basically get the shadow puppetry through um, on the unhallowed rights and maybe boost it also with the howl from beyond. And by doing that, get like a big turn, essentially. Um and that does mean the Nebula Blade effect with the rune chance is soaked with the, um, you know, with the, um, uh, it does mean it is soaked with that effect, but that's all right. Um, so I'm going Unhallowed Rites, Shadow Puppetry into Howl from Beyond. Now, to be honest, looking at this again, I think in this situation, without knowing what is on the top of my deck, the shadow puppetry is a very big gamble that I'm not sure I would have done again. So, for example, I don't have the sword active. Therefore, I cannot swing um, again unless I flip an attack action card that plays from Banish. Now, variants in my deck, I play a lot of attack action cards that can play from Banished. You know, there's about 10 of them. So it's very likely I can flip something very, like... Sorry, when I say 10, I mean, um, I think I'm playing... Well, we can check, can't we? Um, let me have a quick check. I can do an exact count for you guys. Oop. What's happening there? Right. Yeah. So, how many attack action cards that play from Banished? 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18. 18. So the odds of getting something that I can play from Banished are quite high. So it is a calculated gamble that I took here. Um, and also because he's running so low on cards, it became a good choice, right? To try and get that extra damage in. But it also would have been a smart choice given the state of the game and the fact that we're... You know, the fact that we're at a position where there are still quite a few turns left in this game. It would have been a reasonably sensible choice to actually just... Arsenal the shadow puppetry and just swing in with the unhallowed rights um um howl from beyond for seven and just leave that as the chain and then keep the shadow puppetry for next turn because i didn't i didn't need it in it in this in this you know in this situation it paid off but i think either choice would have been valid um the safer choice obviously just arsenal the shadow puppetry have the go again for next turn you still have the scalers um, the risky choice, taking the gamble, flipping one of 18 cards, just not necessary when your opponent is on 24 life, right? Um, so we've got a command and wait. I can't command and conquer that. No, no. Let's just remind ourselves, command and conquer. Defense reactions cannot be played. So have we both made a mistake there? Let's just go back and check. I played Fate for Scene. And I took two damage. Yep. Okay. That's a definite mistake. So sorry about that. Sorry about that team. Um, and that would have, well, I didn't have anything in my arsenal, but it would have put me on a lot less health. So that probably is a rather big mistake to be seeing now. Um, neither I nor my opponent spotted it. So it's not, you know, it's on me. It's not just on me. Um, both players, remember, have a responsibility to uh maintain the game state um and it's always a bit tricky with these kind of games because you know i was playing quite late at night he was playing quite early in the morning so we were both kind of tired um and that's always kind of the problem because he's from australia and i'm from the uk you're never going to get a good parity of of um i will say alertness <laughs> you'll never get a good parity of alertness on um on this front anyway so on the, but it's okay i mean in cc a mistake like that is not as impactful on the game as it is in blitz but it's still pretty annoying to see that in my own gameplay because obviously i shouldn't be making mistakes like that 
and I would be on a bit less life. I wouldn't have husked it. I still wouldn't have husked it. Um, I would have gone down to 14, but I wouldn't have husked that. Um, I would have just let it happen. Um, and then, because he, he didn't have any cards or resources to pummel it or anything like that. So I would have just gone down to 14 and then used the husk next turn. But you kind of see what I mean about Dimensional Crossroads and Husk. Even though I'm playing Husk, I still had the Dimensional Crossroads for, you know, for how many turns now? Like um, four, five? Um, it's still done about five or six arcane damage. Um, I pitched a second one that I didn't want to put into play, you know, and I'm still keeping that pressure up on my opponent. Our health has kind of like leveled out now as my chains have started to take over and the pressure has started adding up. Um, arseling that razor reflex so I can use it to get go again or, or push some damage in. So at this point, you'll see I'm blocking with the Red Rift Bind, mostly because I want to keep the blues for pitching. Um, Dimensional Gateway can get me more cards if I need it. Shadow Puppet Trees for the go again. And the Rift Bind to pitch. Um, blocking with a red, you know, I don't want a red Rift Bind in my hand. I'm happy to block with it. Blocking a bit of that damage. So this is just the mod acting up. He was trying to banish Herald of Ravages. He couldn't pull it out of his, um, his soul zone or whatever you want to call it. Um... And then it went into his hand. So we, we fixed that. He got a shield. I took a damage. Um, and then I banished five cards and I hope for gold. And I think I got two Seeds of Agony, which was not exactly what I wanted this turn. Um, <laughs> if we're being honest. Uh, so I played those. As far as I'm aware, I think I played those for the one arcane, and I just opt. Didn't want the command and conquer. Put that on the bottom, and really at this point, I'm just praying for a def attack reaction, and I just get another seeds, which is very frustrating, because um, obviously that's the last thing I want. Um, and at this point, I have two resources. I have no. You know, I have no attack actions. <laughs> and I'm just trying to decide what to do with myself. So I think at this point, I just said, fuck it. Uh, sorry, shouldn't swear. Um, I just said, screw it. I took the damage from the seeds. Um, I think I played one to activate Dimensional Crossroads. I played the blue. Because um, it wasn't going to do much good there. Um, and that activated Dimensional Crossroads for one. Um, and then I swung with the Nebula Blade with my remaining resources. This is why Nebula Blade is good. Like, you play one attack, non-attack action, and you can... Um, this is just me reminding myself that even if I drop down to 13 because of Blood Debt, uh, the Husk doesn't go away until the start of my turn. So I can take Blood Debt damage now and not have to worry about it until next round, which is going to be kind of important. Um... Yep, so in comes the Nebula Blade. Um, and now we're in that great situation where he has to decide, you know, do I do I sink a card? Do I sink two cards? I think what he did here was block for three and then use the footsteps to block for another one because um, he had a floating resource. Um, let's just see if I remembered correctly. So he's blocking for three. Yeah, he must have done that because I um I didn't get a rune chant. So, yeah. I think that's what he did. 
Um, draw my hand. More Seeds of Agony. More Shadow Puppetry. Oh, no, I kept the Shadow Puppetry. More Seeds of Agony, though. Um, and now I've basically got four Seeds of Agony. Um, six Shackles. Like, things are a bit rough at this point. Um, the only good news is that whatever he swings with, I can just block with the Husk. So I will do that. Because um, that's going to go regardless. Uh, and then I take one damage, which puts me on 12, which is not the end of the world. Um, this would have been the perfect turn for him to have a Chains of Eminence in his arsenal, um, as the seeds would be pretty guaranteed. And once I start flipping my seeds, you know there's probably likely to be more seeds there, just because a lot of them get put on the bottom in the early game. But as it is, I've got two seeds at hand. I flip six cards. You know, we have... Two that can be played, which is a bit harsh, but that's all right. Um, and that's a blue unhallowed rights, which I don't really want to see here, but I got, so that's okay. Um, and I've got two yellow seeds in my hand. So, yeah. Play out the two red seeds. Seems to be nice. And I think here I'm trying to decide if I want to get that Vexing Malice just for an extra one damage. Um, but I think definitely going Shadows of Ursa for two physical and two arcane is a strong play. It also gives me the Seeds of Agony to use for the Unhallowed... Well, the Unhallowed Rites is already on. But basically I can use the Seeds of Agony with the Unhallowed Rites then um, to get my next attack through, uh, depending on how he blocks. And I've got so many resources at this point that I think it's a good idea to get that Shadow Puppetry um, and the Unhallowed Rites to get go again, which will then let me use the extra two resources to stab with my sword, depending on what I find. Um, and I put one of the seeds on the bottom, as you should. The red seeds, fantastic to get on the bottom. And then I'm just tidying up because I technically ended the combat chain. So I have two resources floating. That's what he was asking about. That's why I put the dice there. So this is only Seeds of Agony for three and one arcane damage. So it's not huge. Um, but at this stage of the game, he is trying to think, how do I block? How do I stop this? Um, without giving up tempo completely, because he knows that I'm getting higher on Shackles. Um, which becomes more and more of a threat every turn. And my deck is running out. I'm down to about 25 cards now. But we are reaching the point of the deck that I have stacked um, with uh, blood deck cards and things like that. So it is getting good for me at this point. Um, you know, we haven't seen the Eclipse yet that I pitched earlier. That's coming up soon. Um, you know, we haven't seen... And there's lots of there's lots of very good blood deck cards that we haven't seen yet. Um, that I have pitched earlier on in the game that will be coming up soon. Um, so I razor that because I definitely want to get the hit. And just see what's on the top of my deck because I think he's running low on resources. So this is a good time to push through an attack. And if I don't see anything good, I can still pitch the red razor. I can still pitch the seeds and come in for four. So I have go again. Um, so I definitely just do that. I pitch the seeds and I swing for four with the sword as well. Potentially getting yet another block out of the hand or getting some damage. And he has the sink below, which he's obviously been holding for the sword, which is a good shout. Holding a four strength defense reaction for the sword is a good call um, as it stops that rune chant, that extra bit of um, thing. Yep. Yeah, so then I lose a life, draw four cards. There's my eye of Aphidia which is not exactly what I want to see at this point, especially because I have the crown in play and not the um, carrion fold. 
Um, in fact, I probably shouldn't have the crown. I really should just have the carrion fold. I was really thinking about what happens if I play against my kind of prism deck, but actually, I don't even think you need it against the aura prism deck that I play. I think you just deal with merciful retribution head on and worry about it later. Um, so he's going to make a shield. He's just trying to get my help to pull it out. Which, yeah, it's fine. Um, yeah. So he gets a shield. He stabs me with a shield. I'm not going to block it. Um, I'm not spending a card to block one. And then he ends his turn, which is not really an impressive turn at this stage um, of the game. We're kind of in that death spiral part of the game. Um, there's my Ursa token, which always seems to make its way into my deck. Um, but what can you do? You know, we're both kind of looking at my deck at this point because it is starting to run low. But, you know, it's not run out yet. And um, I still have options. Yeah. So out comes the Seeds of Agony. I want to get that Plunder Run into my arsenal. The next turn, 100%. And he plays Arclight Sentinel. So this was the Arclight Sentinel turn. It wasn't the end of the world because essentially it was basically I pitched two cards, including my eye to make a rune chant, which was fantastic from my perspective. Um, I put the plunder run on the bottom because I didn't want to draw it. I was happy drawing the blue shadow of Ursa um, just because I thought I might not, I might need more blues. Um, and then I was really happy just getting that plunder run into my arsenal. So I think I just swung in with something. I can't remember if I did the sword or I took two damage. We'll see in a second. Um, no, I just played the Unhallowed Rites. And then I think nothing happens just because it poo it disappears straight away. Um, the Rune Chant does go off, though, because it's an attack action. So Seeds doesn't work. Unhallowed Rites doesn't work. Um, uh, but the Rune Chant does go off. And he does take... Or did he have a spare resource? I think he had a spare resource. And then I take two Blood Debt because I've got those two cards there now. But I do get Plunder Run in my arsenal, which is a pretty big, a pretty big turn, you know. Um, and I draw the Eclipse. You'll see my Husk has just gone on the bottom of my deck. Um, I think I realize in a second and I pull it out again. But yeah, <laughs> we have a we have a moment where we're looking for it. Like where where has the Husk gone? Uh, but looking at it in reverse, you can definitely see that. You know, yeah, there we go. So those are the two cards I pitched. And there's the husk. Perfect. Um, so if you're wondering how to do that on TTS, if you hold Alt and then right click when you're holding. So when you're holding a pile of cards, if you hold Alt and right click, you will drop the bottom one off. Okay. At this point, I'm asking myself, how many Arclight Sentinels does he have left? Um, he has one, um, which is fine, but, you know, Clearly, I have to just make do with whatever I can. I banish five Blood Deck cards, and I have drawn Eclipse into my hand. I put Enlightened Strike in the wrong pile, which I should not do. Um, I think that's the first time I've done that this game. You can occasionally mess that up. It's it's very easy to do. Um, but, of course, it is very important to get all those cards banished where they should be um, and not, um, you know, not in the wrong pile. So I get out the Seeds. And I'm trying to think my way through the turn here because obviously I want to play Eclipse um, as that he does have cards in his soul. He has two of them. So I will get a free go again. Um, but it's kind of tricky because I didn't want to banish too many blues and not be able to pay for the Howl from Beyonds. So I start off with um, um, a Seeds of Agony into a Shadows of Versa with Go Again, banishing another Shadows of Versa. And at this point, I'm thinking to myself, I could have played the Plunder Run before I did this. But I kind of want to see if he's going to defend before I build into a bigger attack um, that he's not going to see coming. So I'm kind of trying to bait some cards out of his hand with a smaller attack so that he, you know, doesn't necessarily see things coming. And this is kind of where you see like my deck is a bit 
rift bind heavy late game like i really don't want those blue rift binds at this stage in the game i do want the red so i shouldn't really pitch them as much as i do um but the blues on this turn would probably still come in for um five or four so they're not terrible i mean um how from beyond plus seeds of agony into a blue rift bind is still coming in for six you know that can be a nice finisher turn um yeah so he pitches he makes a he has a shield already um what does he make a shield let's see what he's doing there i think he made a shield No, he pitches to stop the arcane damage, of which there is one. So I don't know why he's going down to one resource, but um, I think he spotted something else. Um, and then he blocks for two, which is fine. But he still has his shield up. And then I have to decide, do I use the other Shadows of Ursa, banishing Seeds of Agony, so I pitch the Eclipse, or do I come in with something a bit bigger? Um, and I think at this point, I decided to come in with something a bit bigger. Um, I'm just realizing that I played the cards in the wrong order. So I just say, actually, wait, let's plunder run first. Um, and then I'm going to howl from beyond. Um, I'm going to get shackle up to seven. Um, or actually, I think I just decide to go with the um, scalers first. Just because it is a one strength attack, I think it's probably a better idea to go with the scalers first. Um, so then that rift bind is coming in for plus two from its ability sorry plus three from its ability plus three from plunder run and plus three from how from beyond so that is coming in for 12 <laughs> which is not a small amount of damage so coming in for 12 hard to block hard to block fully um yeah plus three plus three plus three and three 12 um which means it's very likely at this stage that i will draw a card and or force most of his defensive cards from his hand. Um, but he is on 14. So, you know, he has got a bit of life to play with. Um, yeah, so he loses the shield. I draw a card and he takes 11 damage down to three. And I think he's keeping those cards because he's worried about what I can do next. Um, but I break the scalers now because I have another blue, so I can banish that. Um, I've played five cards with Blood Debt. I banish the Seeds of Agony. Come in for two. Um, I'm not going to play that Seeds of Agony. Like It's not going to be played in terms of getting me to um, you know, somewhere else. But I am going to play the Seeds of Agony so I can play Eclipse and summon ursa at this point he has got two cards in his soul so i can happily swing for free with ursa um i don't even need to get a shackle no i don't need to get a shackle here it has go again um i think i remember that in a second um because he has two cards in his soul so i actually just get rid of the shackle because um you know i i'm still at the stage where i'm playing chain quite fluidly as in Oh, I'll get a shackle. No, wait, 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 actually. And I'm I'm switching things around, especially because this is a more casual format. You know, if you weren't playing in the charity event, it very much was a casual format um, where people were a bit more forgiving. The games were played very flexibly on time. You kind of just, you know, just, just kept it going, had a bit of fun. Um, so, you know, saying something like, oh, play this, get a shame. Actually, wait, I can't. I don't need to. That's fine. Um, it's fine. I mean, you know, hopefully people are understanding it, these kind of things, obviously, when we reach the highest level of competition at say like a road to nationals or a nationals you need to expect people to be much better at this but um ultimately you know this is all just learning in preparation of the proper professional level events especially here in the uk where we haven't really had a large event um oh sorry that has ended so let's um let's go back to just a nice uh gentle background uh, to wrap things off, sorry for the infinite tunnel of uh, OBS. So yeah, that was the last game I played in this Classic Constructed series. I do have the other games recorded. Um, I have been tempted to commentate on them. I probably will. There were some really good games in there. But I think that one was a really good demonstration of what Chain aims to do in CC. You know, starting off reasonably slow, 
getting attacks depending on what you banish um keeping that blue if you get a good banish you can go a bit more aggressive trying to get that tempo not afraid to take a bit of damage to get the tempo and then once you get up to like the shackles five and six uh, maybe four five and six you're starting to go the second you see that aggressive flip on the shackles you're like can i get the shadow puppetry in can i get the go again do i have an art of war you know can i just go for it and then when you get late game you know can i get eclipse can i get all this other stuff and that's just kind of how it works so i hope you found this interesting um obviously this is the sort of video that i'm doing these days is game reviews um talking about the meta strategy that kind of thing that's the part that's interesting me at the moment um, I'm not really keen on talking about the market. Everyone knows what's going on there. There is a, a a retrace on the value of the cards because they were way overinflated. They were overinflated at the point that they were bought in the shops. The boxes should never have been at the price that they were at, um, especially based on the demand. Like there is still boxes available at that price um, or a couple of hundred quid lower. So the fact that the stores sold it at 500 and it immediately dropped back to two or back to two or 300, we're talking dollars, um, is just just means they overpriced it to be honest it just means they they gouged the market with a limited with an artificial um an artificial limitation on supply where they only they really knew how much they had they didn't put it all up they let it sell out they let the price increase artificially um and then they were stuck and then they took a massive benefit and people who bought them because they thought that's how much they were worth were stung and then the price of singles had to drop because no one had money to buy singles because they'd all spent it at the first level with the stores. But I don't really want to talk about that. I mean, that's just, that is what's going on. If the game gets big, all of these limited print run sets will have some value. Is it going to be five, ten times what you paid? Probably not. But you should at least get your money back from the boxes. And really, that's all the CCG is about. You know, it's all about cards having a bit of value so you don't lose money every time you open a product. So that you have a chance to get a bit of money back so it's not just you know i had to spend 600 800 dollars a set it is very much a well i spent 800 dollars in a set but then i sold the cards i didn't want i made 400 back i made some good trades you know it is about that market level of i'm engaged in this game the cards have value which means that i can get ways of getting my money back and getting some value back which makes it more of a hobby to collect and trade and sell than it is just to spend money to get the cards like it would be in an LCG model or that kind of thing. So, you know, that's worth bearing in mind. Um, other news, just to wrap things off, I mean, for the people who are listening here, um, we did have a successful UK skirmish in um, Dark Sphere. It was Pods of Six. Um, I did win a Cold Foil Bolton in the raffle. I am excited. I have also won a Cold Foil Prism in another raffle, um, which is good. And obviously, I've played in a ton of skirmishes. So I'm very much hoping that my name comes up on that raffle list that LSS put out at the end. Um, and generally, it's just been great getting back in, playing Flesh and Blood with people in person. It's been fantastic. Um, this week, I am apparently need to self-isolate because someone in the pub I went to, it was a huge pub, may have had COVID. But... Um, that is fine. You know, what can you do? That is what it is. Uh, so, you know, this week I may be locked down until at least Friday, but that's okay. Um, anything else going on, really? Uh, no. Um, I'm going to be doing another one of these videos, I think, with my Aura Prism deck. Uh, the four decks I'm building for CC at the moment are Ninja, Prism, um, so Ninja Illusionist, uh bravo when crucible unlimited comes out because i need all the crucible unlimited stuff and of course the chain deck you've already seen which i have all the cards for so prism and chain are done i need to finish bravo i have all the cards for ninja i'm generally just gonna be building up those four decks because i think they're gonna be the meta decks and i'll decide which one i'm actually playing when we get around to the actual road to nationals chain is definitely a contender he's definitely very strong but he is also punished rather heavily by Chains of Eminence in the meta and a few other meta choices. So um, I think something more like controlly, like maybe an Aura Prism deck or a defensive Katsu or even just Bravo, maybe the answer. Um, I don't really know yet. We'll see. Um, expect a video on it. Maybe not once I crack it, but maybe after a few tournaments, once I've cracked the code and if um, it's working and I'm winning, then, you know, uh, maybe I'll share the love after that. 